I'm going to give actually three thanks, and I'm going to ask you guys to applause. We'll get the blood going. Uh, first thank you is I want to give a, a nice warm thank you round of applause to Peter Meissen. Yeah. <laughs> so it's Peter's birthday today. Oh, yeah, happy yeah. birthday. I, I now get my senior discount. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Peter is, the, Peter is the founder and director here at the Global Energy Network Institute, this space that we're in, and they've graciously um, agreed to host us this evening for this discussion. So thank you, Peter. I had the, the, um, the fortune, the good fortune of sitting next to him on a, on a flight out to our annual Socially Responsible Investment Conference a few years ago. It gets to know him a little bit better. He has literally spent his career traveling around the world, educating people on the importance of renewable energy and the potential of renewable energy. And uh, so, Peter, if you could just say a few words about your work and what you're doing here. Sure. Speakers have to have mics tonight. And if you're asking a question, you have to use this mic tonight, OK? Right. Again, Peter Meissen, I'm the director of the Global Energy Network Institute. That's our website up there, genie.org. Uh, the background on that in the simplest way is there's a man named Buckminster Fuller that asked a global question. And that question is stated up there. I'll summarize it. How do we make a decent living standard? How, how do we provide a decent living standard for everybody sustainably? That's the core question of this world game. The number one answer to that is clean energy for everybody. And we've been working on linking renewable resources around the world for 25 years as a nonprofit doing research education and provoking policymakers around the world. Uh, would you, on the other side of that, click on the other button up at the top there, Katie, right up there? The Sim Center button, see that one at the very top that I'm pointing at? And so the place that you're in is a place called the World Resource Simulation Center. Bucky also said we needed a venue to get together to grapple with the hard issues of our day. So that's what we do here. We visualize, you can see, right? Visualize sustainable solutions to both global and local problems so we make more informed choices quicker. That's what we're about. So you better understand the past trends, so we understand the historic trends on an issue, put those up around the room, put up projections for the future, because that's what you're really interested in, where we're headed, and again, making smarter decisions quicker. So that's the work that we do here. We have staff over in the corner. We have some volunteers tonight. Uh, please go ahead and ask them what we do, and, and, uh, and uh, we're thrilled to have you here, and Shane, to have you here. Uh, do you want to start with your speakers now? I'm going to give a couple more thank Okay, a couple more things. And then yeah. I, for those of you that are laptops, I've given you just a little coaching. I'm going to give you about a minute, of it, a minute of instruction right when we start. And then you'll understand that this room, I think, is the best presentation room in town. Go, so go ahead, Shane. All right, I agree. Thanks, Pete. All right, so the second thank you I want to give is to Stephen Heverly. Stephen is the executive director at Equinox and our, our co-sponsor for this event this evening. I know Stephen through my work as, a, as the treasurer of the San Diego Leadership Alliance. And uh, Stephen is a, an, an avid environmentalist. And I'm always impressed with his, his kind of, I don't want to say global knowledge, because I don't want to confuse that with the real global nature of what we're doing here. But, but he, he just is involved with everything. I think he's passionate about social environmental issues. And, uh, and, I'm, and I think you're doing a great job as the executive director of Economics. You guys are doing some really good work. And uh, so if you could just say a few words about what you guys are doing, maybe make a plug uh, for your recent water report. And your uh, managing director, sorry, at uh, Equinox Center. Um, each year, so we're a local nonprofit research institute um, that supports the focus of um, both the environment and the economy. So we want to lead from the middle support um, policies and initiatives and advocate on those things that are both supporting our economic growth and supporting um, preserving the environment. So, and that's why, that's why we're a part of this um, initiative here. Um, we feel that this is right in the wheelhouse of, you know, investing in renewable energy is right in the wheelhouse of, of something that we know is, is going to help move us forward and, and move the needle in the right direction related to greenhouse gases and climate change. I should plug our quality of life dashboard we put out each year. Um, this, uh, we're coming up on the 2015 version. I've got a bunch of copies here. Um, this is a snapshot of how we're doing sustainably around the region. And we do include renewable energy portfolio of our local utility here. We also include water consumption and air quality and things like that. So we're really the go-to 
organization related to quality of life here in the, in the region. So I appreciate Shane and all the work that you're doing here and that we've got a, a good looking panel ahead of us. And, and if I, uh, my board would kill me if I didn't say at a, at a forum related to investment, um, we're here to be invested in as well, Equinox <laughs> Center. And uh, I think your dollars go to a lot of great work um, if you are uh, donating to us. And so we've also got some envelopes up here next to the dashboards if you wanna, if you wanna learn a little bit more about that. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Steve. All right, so my third and final thank you goes to all of you. Thank you for coming here on a Thursday night, fighting traffic, fighting downtown parking, to be here to learn about, uh, well, I hope you learned something, um, about an important topic, important issue. And um, I'm excited to see a lot of people here I don't know, actually. I, I, I know a lot of you. I've met you before. Um, but there's some new faces here. So thank you especially for coming. And, and for being a part of this conversation. So for those of you I don't know, my name is Shane Yonston. I'm a financial planner. I'm an investment advisor. I'm the founder of Impact Investors. And I've been focusing on socially responsible investing for a little over a decade now. When I got started uh, about 11 years ago, I was working at Wells Fargo in their private client services division. And it was about a year into it. And I, when I started to feel a little bit uh, unsettled, maybe is the right word, with the work that I was doing, I loved and love still following the markets and researching funds and I love working with people and helping them achieve their financial goals. So that all was very good. Uh, but I had a, done my underground, uh, undergrad studies in global studies, which is basically international politics and economics. And I had learned about um, really it's kind of post-Cold War trends. So what happened after this uh, dichotomous world of, of um, you know what the Cold War was. Well, at the end of that, in the 80s, we're talking about capitalism and democracy reigning the day around the world and opening up markets and setting up trade agreements like NAFTA. And so what was going through my mind at the time, I was thinking, okay, well, we've got this trend known as, have you guys ever heard of the downward spiral or the race to the bottom? I guess it could be used in other contexts. But in, in the context of, of geopolitical economics, which is where I was coming at it from, we were, we were seeing, and we have been seeing, um, companies outsourcing all their, their manufacturing and their sourcing of goods and services from uh, countries that could provide the lowest cost, kind of the lowest, um, um, the lowest, uh, what do I want to say? Yes, right? So, so countries, especially like in Latin America or in, in developing worlds, were incentivized to lower their standards, lower their labor standards, lower their environmental standards, make it really cheap to attract foreign capital. And I thought to myself, well, this is not a sustainable business model. Eventually, people who are being oppressed, who are being paid an un unlivable wage, they, they revolt. And eventually, uh, our ecosystem breaks, right? You can only extract so many resources before the, the balance of our ecology, it, it just doesn't function anymore. So it's not a sustainable business model. It doesn't make sense long term. Not only that, it, it doesn't feel ethical. So I'm, I'm helping these people invest their money in, in companies that I didn't necessarily agree with their business models. And, uh, and so I started doing some research. And I learned about this whole uh, sector of the investment world called socially responsible investing. And I thought, aha, I'm not the first one who's thought of this. Uh, there's a whole group of people out there who have been working on this for decades and uh, have come up with some really great investment vehicles, really great funds that have had some really great successes. And so I spent about six months putting together a business plan. And I looked at things like um, the, the United States Social Investment Forum's trend report. And this is our trade organization based out of Washington, DC. And every two years, they come out with a trends report, which shows a lot of different things. One of the things it shows is that year after year, more and more money has been flowing into socially responsible investments than have been flowing into the broader market. And I looked at things like, uh, the Moskowitz Prize, which is an annual prize given by the Haas School of Business up in Berkeley. And, uh, and it's a global academic prize awarded to uh, professors of finance at Wharton and PhD students. It's a rigorous uh, academic prize. And what they're looking for is they're looking for a correlation between companies' social environmental policies and their bottom line financial return. 
right? So you can go onto their website and you can find all this academic research. I plugged some of that into my business plan. And I looked at things like actual funds that were performing very competitively with their non-socially responsible counterparts. And I looked at the demographics of San Diego. And there's a lot of wealth in this community. And there's some philanthropy. Maybe there could be more. And some, some of us in the, some of you guys in the nonprofit world could, could argue that we could be giving more to, uh, to the nonprofit world. But my, my argument was why can't we merge these two? You know, why do we have to invest one way and then, and then give away in another way? Why can't we kind of take these two concepts and blend them together? So I, I took this uh, business plan to my manager and she said, uh, I think she was being very polite. She, she kind of held back a little bit of a chuckle, but she said, this is, not, this is not a good fit for us here. Why don't you tell your clients to invest in traditional funds, they'll make more money, and then they can donate the profits to causes that they care about. And I, this was the first, I've heard that many times since then. That was, this is my first time hearing that though, and I was, I was beside myself. I, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So you're telling me I, I should invest in profit from tobacco and then, and then donate to lung cancer research? I mean, doesn't that seem inefficient and, and a little bit ludicrous, right? So, so I took my business plan and I went to UBS, I went to Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch and Smith Barney and, um, and I got very similar responses. And so I decided at that point that I would, I would start my own business. So I went independent and that was in 2005 and I've been focusing on social responsible investing ever since. And uh, some, some irony in that is a couple years later I got a phone call from a recruiter and I got to talking to her on the phone and I said, well, who, who hired you? And she was recruiting financial advisors specializing in socially responsible investing. Hired by Wells Fargo, <laughs> right? Yeah, I laughed out loud also. And uh, of course I passed on that opportunity and, and just the other day, this week, I showed my wife, she's here in the back. We have this headline in Investment News Magazine Missing on impact, advisors lag in embracing socially responsible options sought by clients. Right, so this is, an, this is still an issue. Needless to say though, these big, bigger players now are getting on, on the bandwagon. Uh, Morgan Stanley has got a, an impact investing institute out in North Carolina. Merrill Lynch has got a, a socially, well they don't call it socially responsible investing. That term is kind of um, out of vogue these days. But, but, um, but they are seeing the writing on the wall, which is, uh, investors want, we want more than just a financial return. We want more than, than just a profit off the business as usual model. And, uh, and we're starting to put that demand in, uh, to work with our dollars. Um, so I tell that story uh, partly as an introduction myself, why I'm here moderating this panel, uh, but also as a broader segue to the topic that we're talking about tonight, which is the movement from fossil fuels to renewable energy. From dare I say, the dirty economy to the clean economy. And it's a huge move. This is a huge move, and we're just at the beginning of it. So all of us in this room, we're on the cutting edge, just for being here and thinking about this, whether you're thinking about your own investments or you're interested in, in the policy initiatives or, or you know, CalPERS or uh, your, uh, your university's endowment, how we invest our money, how we allocate our dollars makes a difference. And it, in Masada, in your email, you said it, it's the money, I think you said something like it's the money, you didn't say stupid, but you said something like, uh, you know, money talks, right? So, so this is an important topic and I'm glad you guys are here. And um, I want to get started by introducing our first speaker. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to introduce all of our speakers just very briefly. And so you got to get a sense of who's up here. And then I'm going to let them do a five or seven minute presentation about the work that they're doing. And then we'll do a Q&A. And I've put cards on the end of tables. You don't have to use them, but it might help us facilitate a Q&A. If you think of a question, you can write it down on your card. And Stephen, where are you sitting? Where'd you go, Stephen? There he is. If you don't mind, help me out. If you have a cue card, you have a question, holding up the air, Stephen will grab me, he'll bring it over here. And that way I can organize the questions in queue. And we'll do most of the presentation uh, with you guys dialoguing and, and answering your questions on this. Sound good? All right. Okay, so we'll start with Nicole. And like I said, I'll introduce all of them. Nicole Capretz, I've probably known you for about 10 years now. 
And um, she's, uh, a lot of you probably already know her, she's a huge uh, activist locally, and uh, she's uh, now founded the uh, Climate Action Campaign, which is focused on implementing and then becoming a watchdog for local legislation, the Climate Action, um, uh, I'm sorry, the Climate Change uh, Plan, simple name, Climate Change Plan, and uh, locally here that's going to be voted on uh, early next year. And um, so she's going to be talking more about from a policy legislative side of things. Then we've got uh, Neil Stallings. He's vice president at Green Century Funds. And they are a mutual fund, but sure. the average everyday mutual fund. They're a socially responsible mutual fund. And they've been very outspoken on uh, divestment from fossil fuels. Uh, they were founded by a group of uh, environmental uh, advocacy groups about 25 years ago and based out of Boston. Uh, then we have Masada Dissenhouse. She's with the local 350 group. I'm not going to say 350.org. And if you don't know what 350 is, you're, you're going to be pretty um, uh, excited about what they're doing. Um, they're very focused on divestment and um, it's a global movement. It's a global organization, 188 countries, very focused on grassroots advocacy and um, they're trying to put pressure on, on the state pensions and local pensions, and she'll get more into the details of that and the work that they're doing. And then finally, we've got David Scher. And David Scher is the co-founder of a really exciting a clean energy, renewable energy uh, fund that is investing in existing wind and solar projects that are selling their renewable energy to off-takers uh, like utility companies, for example, that are mandated to get a certain amount of their energy um, from renewables, and uh, providing a, a stable income stream for investors, which I really like. It's different than, you know, if you look at the renewable energy sector in the publicly traded market, it's extremely volatile. So what David has designed is a, is a fund that gives us access and opportunity to profit from the clean energy uh, market without all of that bumpy volatility. All right, so that's our panel. We've got some private sector, we've got some legislation, we've got some advocacy. And, and the reason why we want to have a panel like this is because this is a dynamic challenge, right? This is something that we're, uh, we're going to have to have a grassroots movement. We're going to have to move our money and our public pensions. And we're going to have to you know, vote for legislation and call our representatives. Um, and so this should be a good talk. Without further ado, Nicole, why don't you tell us about the work that you've done? Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. This is, I mean, this is pretty cool to see your presentation like surrounding you. It's like, ooh, it's like ultra, yeah, alternative world. Um, so again, my name is Nicole Kaparitz, and thank you so much, Shane, for inviting me and to participate on this panel. I just came back from Oakland, where I was at another local clean energy conference, and I say that because there was another crowd that was just like this, of you know, a congregation of people who were really motivated and invested in turning. Um, Northern California into um, a clean power future, and so it's it's pretty gratifying to see that there's you know in the same day to go to two different places where you have a similar crowd of people who are willing to spend their free time to figure out how we're going to make this really fundamental transition to clean energy. So a little bit about me. I know a lot of you in this room, but <clears throat> I do have this background, a very kind of interesting background of being both inside and outside government. So I've kind of been at the intersection of advocacy, of or grassroots organizing, and of policy development inside City Hall. And so I have been mostly focused on local government, <clears throat> done and was also in Sacramento the other day. So I also do some state lobbying, but mostly my passion is local government because I do believe that cities are driving the change, frankly, in the world. I mean, if you look at what's happening in Congress today, I mean, actually, nothing's happening in Congress. If only bad things are happening in Congress, and so it really is up to the cities to take the lead on this and, and drive the movement. And that's kind of I, I feel very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to work at City Hall and help um, uh, move the needle forward. So when I was fortunate enough to work um, for Todd Gloria when he was the mayor for eight months uh, or six months, the first thing he said to me was, "So you've been pestering me for years about." the city's climate plan and that we haven't done anything on it. Well, here's your opportunity. Like, finally, what do you need? I'll give you all the resources, all the support you need, but you, you know, you're on, a, you're on a limited timeline. You've got to get this thing done and out the door. Like, we do not want to leave office without a climate plan that's complete. So I had my mission, 
And I loved it, of course. I was obsessed with it. I don't think I talked to anybody else in the office for like six months. Um, because it's, it's, really, it's a comprehensive document, and it's really challenging. It's very technical, um, and you have to do it right. And I, and I really want to make sure that this is a groundbreaking plan. And I think what the city's draft plan is, is precedent setting. So, um, and where I'm now, so I spent, I, um, so after uh, my time in the mayor's office, then I was at uh, city council office for a while. And then, you know, my, my personal political philosophy is that leaders don't lead, they follow. And so I knew that in order for this climate plan to get passed and implemented, I had to kind of go on the outside to join organizations like 350 to hold the elected officials accountable and to sort of build that base of support, right, like all you all here, to, to, to give the elected officials cover. They really need cover. They really need to know that what they're doing is supported. They, you know, they get nervous and they, they really like to feel like, hey, I'm doing what the community wants me to do. So my organization is called the Climate Action Campaign. Simple mission, stopping climate change, right? No big deal. Simple, easy. <laughs> oh, yes. Don't forget this. Um, and yeah, so we, we're focused on passing climate plans, obviously starting with the city of San Diego's um, building the base. And then ideally, you know, the, the strategies and policies and programs that are in the city's climate plan can be scaled and replicated. I mean, right, that's, that's to me the value of the city. We're more nimble than a state or national government can be. But also that means we can kind of work through these policies and, and kind of prove the model. And then hopefully other cities, oh my God, I'm pulling this, um, other cities can replicate them. Um, so you, already, you guys already know all this, but, you know, despite all the um, uh, progress we've made on clean energy, unfortunately, the world's energy is still dirty, 87% dirty. Um, this is a slide I just use in my presentations. I'm going to truncate this presentation. It's, it's too long for this uh, panel. But obviously, we're at unprecedented levels of carbon dioxide in the air that is basically having the scientists, you know, scientists hate to be political. They hate to kind of immerse themselves in controversial items. And yet even they went to the World Economic Forum with this study that they've been working on for five years and said, trying to save elected officials all over the world, like wake up, like life on earth is officially at risk. I mean, they, it's for them, that's such a hard statement to make. You know, they don't, they, they don't like to use hyperbole, they don't like to exaggerate, um, but really they're saying, you know, life supporting systems are at risk. In San Diego, I think obviously also everybody knows it's all about the heat waves, increased fires, sea level rise. Um, and then the next slide, oh sorry, I know Peter's gonna kill me. I'm not good at using this. Um, the next slide is talking about, and th I mean this, this map is, is probably a little bit um, exaggerated as to what will happen, but the reality is that downtown and Mission Beach are kind of ground zero for sea level rise. And the other reality is that the city has not done barely anything to prepare for that. And I don't know if you've all heard, but there's been a lot of conversation in the newspapers about a new stadium, about expanding the convention center, about a Ferris wheel going on, you know, the waterfront. I, you know, I'm not here to say positive, you know, yes or nay to any of those specific projects, but the reality is all the scientists, you know, in our own backyard at Scripps are saying those are exactly the areas that are going to be flooded. So why are we, why would we think about investing in those massive infrastructure projects if they're just going to be flooded, right, become stranded assets? Ooh, are you impressed that I use the word stranded assets? <laughs> Thank you. I am too. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so the, pretty easy to figure out. The pr purpose of the climate plan is to reduce the city's carbon footprint. We are following what the state is saying, that we have to reduce our carbon footprint 80% um, by 2050. And so this is a plan that goes out to 2035. Um, so it's kind of, you know, just hitting that middle mark of getting to the 2050 goals of um, 80%, so we'll get 50% um, by 2035. Probably the most important element of the climate plan are these two words, legally binding. A majority of cities have climate plans, but they're not requirements, they're not mandates, they're voluntary. So they, guess what happens? They don't get implemented, they don't get funded, they don't get prioritized. And so what was really critical to Todd Gloria and I when doing this was to make sure that our um, climate plan was legally binding. The two biggest drivers of carbon emissions in San Diego, I think also not a surprise to this crowd, are transportation and how we heat and cool buildings. So how are we going to solve the climate problem? We're going to move people around in new and different ways, right? Alternative modes of transportation. And we're going to figure out how to totally green the electricity grid. So again, just kind of following that same um, logic, it's all about creating energy and water efficient buildings, clean and renewable energy, which is greening the grid, alternative transportation modes. Um, also, we need to make sure that we are not putting uh, all our waste into the landfills, because that creates a lot of methane, so that's a huge priority for the city. And then climate resiliency, like I was mentioning, 
um, so theoretically, we are tackling the reality of what to deal with the heat waves and the drought and sea level rise. But it, this is, and I think the mayor's office would actually agree with me, um, the weakest part of the plan. And we have a, we have a lot, we have a lot farther to go because clearly the mayor and everybody else in the top levels of government are still talking about coastal development. So clearly, there's a disconnect between kind of what the data and the science says and where we're at. Um, and this, um, the last slide, how to, how the cap. Uh, climate plan changes San Diego's commute. So it's really, sorry, it's really hard to read that slide. But <clears throat> today, again, this is just focused on commute. Today, about 87% of the people drive to the work. But this climate plan, again, sort of transforming our transportation infrastructure is saying um, in 2035, we'd have, I can't even read it, 39% of people driving, 25% taking tra uh, public transit, um, eight, Oh, this is the old slide. This is an old presentation. Sorry, we've actually got updated numbers. Um, so it's 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 about still going to be about one or two percent walking, but eighteen percent of the people biking. So those numbers are not quite right, but it it is it demonstrates how we are completely upending the existing transportation system, and what that means, of course. How do you get there? Money, right? There's no way we can transform our streets so that they're not you know just focused on cars and instead focused on people unless and until we start investing in that. And so that's a whole separate strategy that we'll be working on um, throughout the years. But again, it sort of all hinges back on these two words, legally binding. Oh, I can't mm -hmm. even go back. Um, oh, here we go. Legally binding. So that means these goals, because they seem kind of out there, and like, oh, you know, personally, even I would be kind of cynical and say, oh, that's great, but you'll never get there. But remember, we have to get there, because <laughs> the climate plan goals are legally binding. So that's a beautiful thing, because the city budget prioritizes what they fund based on what's legally binding. So the climate plan, when it's passed, will suddenly rise to the top of what the city has to fund. So that means suddenly you're going to see our streets looking a lot different because they're going to get funded. And that's kind, of, that's kind of why this legally binding, those two words are so pivotal. I am horrible with this thing. Oh my god. Can I just throw it away? <laughs> Can you do it? Uh, no. OK, so next. You go to the next? Yep. OK, so here's the simple instruction you. again. Oh, OK. All you guys with the laptops and count right the torque, right? Hand. Find the down arrow and go one, two, down Nicole, you were an attorney in your former with life. The down arrow. <laughs> Legally by. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's that? I know. Yeah, I wanted everybody to hear that. Wasn't a, that wasn't a slam. There no. we go. Number one, click, click one more, number we're, we're, one. We're, okay, good. That's good. Number three should be at 15. Now would you open up the current slide? There's the current slide there, Bill. There yeah, you go. So that goes, those two are interspersed, but oh well. Okay. I'll, I'll, get them, I'll get them fixed for you. Okay. So again, um, we actually do have a city that has implemented a climate plan has actually changed their entire funding sources for transportation in San Luis Obispo. So it's actually an, a great model that I'm, of course, talking to the mayor's office about. Like here, you want a roadmap for how to actually repurpose our streets and redesign them so they're more safe for um, bikes and, and public transit. This is how you do it. So again, once you adopt the plan, they changed um, their level of service hierarchy to prioritize uh, the alternative transportation modes and shifted the funding. So that's the transportation piece, which is very exciting in my opinion. And then we get to, of course, our the, kind of the hallmark of the plan, which is 100% renewable energy. And the question always becomes, well, how do you do that? Because where do we get our electricity? Where do you, when you move to San Diego, who do you go to to get your electricity? Right, do you have a choice? Right, they have monopoly, right? They have full control. So there's no competition in the marketplace, there's no innovation in the marketplace, there's no efficiency in the marketplace. And at the end of the day, frankly, there's no choice in the marketplace. So what we propose in the climate plan to get to 100% renewable energy is a really exciting initiative called Community Choice Energy. So what this is, is it allows cities, and this was a, this was a program designed by the state to allow cities to control the supply of electricity. So the city or county or a water authority or any other local government agency can break away from their utility and decide, thank you, but we will be deciding what kind of energy is on our grid. So the existing utility, right, sdg &E, will still maintain and um, deliver energy to us because that's kind of what their 
um, focuses and what they excel at, which is delivering power to us over their power lines. So they will continue to do that, but we will get to decide what the source of energy is. And that's where the innovation comes in. And that's where we get to go to 100% renewable energy in a more accelerated fashion. So from the customer's perspective, you know, when, when a customer, you know, any of us, walks into our home or walks into our place of work and turns on the light switch, it just turns on the same. I mean, right, you don't, there isn't a lot of change that a customer is going to see. But what the change the customer will see is that what they've shown so far in existing programs is that you have lower rates, right? You have local control, and you have local accountability because there'll be, there's a local agency that's making these decisions, a nonprofit local agency that is responsive to you. It's a not-for-profit not agency. So unlike sdg &E, which is a private corporate monopoly who has one goal, right, which is to maximize profit for their shareholders, that's their fiduciary duty, Oh, a fiduciary duty. I also want credit for that. Okay. Um, that is their sole responsibility to Wall Street. This is different where this local agency who will be buying energy on behalf of the city, their duty is to respond to you, the community. So it's just, again, sort of upending the existing paradigm and switching it around. And that's how we're going to get to 100% clean energy. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a really innovative model. And it's kind of, it's kind of a hybrid model. Or in LA, for example, or Sacramento, they have a full municipal utility, LA Department of Water and Power. They're in full control of all their water supply and delivery and in full control of all their energy supply and delivery. So this is a hybrid solution. Oh, where am I? Okay. Oh, okay, we, we switched up. Okay, so this is a hybrid solution where again, we'd still have the utility maintaining control over the pipes and wires and delivering that power to us reliably, but we get to control the source. So yeah, so I kind of went over the benefits, um, and then we actually have amazing data from two existing community choice programs in Marin and Sonoma up north, and that's why part of the reason I was up in Oakland, because we were learning more about what's going on up there. And so what they've shown, oh, so I just have some of this, yeah, it's a little bit confusing. Um, so some of the slides are missing, but it's okay, this slide is fine. It just basically shows that in both Sonoma and Marin community choice programs, they are offering lower rates to all residents all commercial customers with a higher renewable energy content, right? That's pretty incredible. That's a win-win-win. It doesn't matter if you don't even care about climate change, right? Or you don't believe, you don't care how much renewable energy content is in the electricity that supplies your home or business. You will have a higher renewable energy content for their default product at a lower cost than what your existing utility is offering. So this really makes it obviously accessible and intriguing to almost anybody who hears about this program. And the reason, you know, I mean, there are many different reasons, but one of the most obvious reasons is that a community choice program is, is small and nimble and flexible and doesn't have the overhead or kind of the institutional kind of stasis that, that you get with these large corporate institutions. They don't have nuclear reactors either. Uh, community choice programs, right, that's correct. Well, that would, you know, but that's, the whole point is that any community ch choice program that starts has a blank slate. So they get to decide what is the, what are the resources that you want your energy to come from, right? You're just starting over. So it was kind of exciting because I did, I did go on NBC's Politically Speaking with sdg &E to talk about community choice. Um, and then Voice San Diego decided to fact check me on whether Marin and Sonoma are offering lower rates for all customer classes with higher renewable energy content, and we got a true rating. So I figured that's like gold. <laughs> I was very nervous. They just send you an email like, hi, we're doing a fact check on you. Talk to you later. And you're like, what? Wait. You know, no. They, they say if you want to give us information or back, back up your statements and all that good stuff. But still, it, this, so this is really important to, again, kind of prove the model to the community. Lots of, and so because of the data, the really compelling data out of Maria and Sonoma, you know, we're not alone in looking at community choice now because it's like, oh, wow, why wouldn't, why, you know, most cities are saying, why wouldn't we explore this opportunity? So you can see this is just kind of a list of um, cities and counties that are exploring it. In Northern California, I mean, it's on fire. Almost daily, you get news articles talking about new counties and cities that are joining the existing uh, community choice programs. So it's pretty exciting. It, and by the way, you know, just, just though to you know, ground truth this a little bit for San Diego. We, we, if we start a community choice program, it would be so um, groundbreaking because the city of San Diego has 40% of sdg &E's load. We're over a million customers. So Marin and Sonoma are awesome, but they're tiny. They're really small. So for the city of San Diego 
to move forward with community choice would be a game changer. So it's gonna take us a while. I say that to say, it's not like this is gonna happen in six months. We have to be really thoughtful. We have to be deliberate. We have to carefully evaluate how it plays into the rest of the electrical grid and the whole state and make sure we're still delivering reliable power. Um, so it's gonna take a while, but the good news is we're already starting. The city has started, and again, because I always wanna give Todd Gloria, um, Councilmember Todd Gloria props, because we did, in a parallel track with developing the climate plan, we actually started a feasibility study for community choice. And that's not easy for, I, I really just always want to give Todd credit, because that is not easy for an elected official to, to do. Because guess what? The minute you sign that letter to sdg &E, that's a signal to them, right? Like, game on. And that's hard for elected officials, because they're a big player in town. So I always, you know, any elected official that moves forward on community choice, I think is courageous. And I think for Todd to sign that letter, signaling that the city's going to study this, not that, you know, we haven't made a decision to, you know, adopt it, but the fact that we're studying it is also, though, I think that's, that's a hard decision for an elected official. Um, and then um, in my presentation, I just sort of talk about the economic development benefits of moving to clean energy economy. Obviously, that fits in exactly with this panel, and they can talk about that more. But, you know, we're nation's number three metropolitan city for clean tech leadership. We're named a top five field prime for job growth. Um, we have the number one solar inst installations in the nation per capita, which is pretty incredible. Um, electric vehicle sales are up. Um, and part of the climate plan is to actually install 30,000 electric vehicle stations in the uh, charging stations. So certainly that's a huge component of the climate plan. Um, and then we're doing a lot with street light retrofits. I mean, you know, so we're, we, we are on the move in San Diego. It's not like we're starting from scratch or, you know, we're just taking a huge leap here. We are, we are already making moves, but it's, it's pretty exciting and I think a really important story to tell about the jobs and economic de development that comes with transitioning away from fossil fuels onto clean energy. So this just talks about, you know, we don't want to create low wage jobs, we want to create high wage jobs. We want to work with the unions, frankly, and make sure that we're creating a sustainable economy where people can still afford to live in San Diego. So this is just an example of some of the wages um, with some of the current um, green clean technology industries. Oh, that's the slide that has the wages. And this slide just sort of talks about the different types of industries. And so finally, I'm almost done. We um, have about an eight-month environmental review process that just kicked off at the city with the climate plan. But there's good news. This is where the public input comes in. So I'm basically on a road show. Me and my team are on a road show. And Brian over here is on my team. Wave your hand. He's also doing presentations. Hey, Brian. Um, and... We're basically talking to all the planning groups, all the town councils, all the business associations, you know, all the traditional stakeholders, because we believe this climate plan is only going to work if the community embraces it and we get buy-in, right? This can't just be an isolated top-down document that the mayor just sort of puts out into the community. Like, we need people to believe that this is the vision of how we want the future to be in San Diego. Like, we do, right? We, we want to build that consensus that this is, like, all about quality of life for future generations. It's a moral imperative. I mean, our, you know, literally our quality of life is, is at stake here. And that's why we think it's so important to go on this road show and talk to community groups like this one, you know, and, and everywhere else throughout the city. Um, and so for anybody who would like to participate in providing public input into the climate plan, please let me know. And I think my last slide even has my, oh yeah, over there, mm. my contact information. So Nicole at climateactioncampaign.org, please, email me, and I'm not sure, I know this is kind of a loose-knit group, obviously, but normally I'm presenting to already organized um, coalitions, and so I do ask for support letters. But again, because I, as I started with, I believe leaders don't lead, they follow. The mayor's office wants these letters. I've talked to them about my presentation, they know exactly what I'm doing, and they're glad, right? Because the mayor did come out, to his credit, and support the plan that Todd put forward, and I do, I do think that's a big deal for a Republican mayor to do that. Uh, embrace a 100% clean energy future, because the SDG was not happy. I'll just go ahead and say that as diplomatically as possible. Um, and so I, and I do think it's important for us to tell the mayor that he's doing the right thing. So he just stays on the right track. I think that's, that's important. Um, and then finally, the feasibility study for the community choice, that community choice initiative, you know, again, it's its own separate review and analysis and study, because it's such a big step for the city to take. Um, that is moving forward, and we should have the results of the feasibility study this year. And then is that my last slide? Yeah. So that's pretty much kind of the landscape uh, for the climate plan in the city that I hope intersects 
with what you're going to hear about Masada, about the the um, plans for divesting from the city's, pen, I assume the city's pension funds. Well, whatever. We'll learn. I'm learning too how we can divert, how divest from fossil fuels, and of course how we can translate all these clean energy jobs and opportunities and industries that we're creating um, into more clean energy investment and profit and opportunity. So any, so I don't know how this works. Yeah, <laughs> so, so let's clap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Okay, so if you guys are thinking about questions, write them down on those cards, put them up in the air, Stephen will grab them and bring them up here. And uh, I'm gonna bounce from kind of public sector policy to private sector investing, so Neil. Sure. You're up next. All right. Thanks, Shane. Hang on and a second, Neil, so I can you know, get your yep. slides set up. Yep. All right, so if you're on a laptop, hit escape. Bot top left, it says escape, so right? <laughs> so now there's a presentation at the bottom. Look at the one that says Green Century. Find the one that says Green Century. Very good. Everybody find that? All right, now can, did you, did you buy the chain? Oh good, you numbered them, I'm so happy. All right, I see at least a seven on one of these, so that's what I'm really pleased with. Well, we'd like to, you know, I'll help you with that one, okay? I understand I'll help you. So we're still working on nine, 10, 11 over here. Did you find the green century one yet? And then what you wanna do is go from, go, go from, I'll, I'll help you on that one, Jasmine. You can maybe help these people here. And then on number two, what you'd like to do is click on, from the current slideshow, we can see this, the slideshow up there, where it says slideshow. Not a new slide. Go over further to the right. At the very top, it says slideshow. Go to the right. Yeah, click that. And then go for, over back to the left, and it says from current slide. So I think. They got to know, Peter. We'll get, you, we'll get you going. We got enough to get you started. Okay? All right. Uh, thank you to Shane, uh, to the birthday boy Peter, to Stephen for having us, and to all the staff of Genie. This is an incredible space, and if this is intended to be a collaborative space to address and solve the world's greatest problems, then I think it's absolutely apropos that we're here to tackle the issue of global climate change. I'm Neil Stallings. I'm with Green Century Capital Management. We're the investment advisor to the Green Century Funds. They were started 25 years ago, and we are very proudly the first family of diversified, responsible mutual funds to be entirely fossil fuel free, and I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. Um, like Shane, I came to this space, I had a mid or early life crisis, existential crisis about what I was gonna do with my, my career in high tech. I worked for a, a global business practices unit of a Fortune f uh, 100 uh, tech company in the Bay Area, and it was burning me out. It was a white collar sweatshop, and I wanted to mesh uh, my political interest with my economic interest into building a sustainable world. And I found this niche sector of what was originally called uh, socially responsible investing has now kind of been rebranded as sustainable and responsible investing. Uh, Values-based investing, integrated investing. Um, there's many ways to actually talk about integrating your values to be more consistent with your beliefs so that you're not have this cognitive dissonance um, and to also do that in a very profitable way. Um, Green Century was formed in 1991 by a coalition of environmental nonprofit groups that fall under the PERG umbrella. That's the Public Interest Research Group. So there are eight state-based PERGs, in, including CalPERG, and one fund for the uh, public interest based in Washington, D.C., that seeded, founded, continue to own our company. And I introduce it that way to, to explain that all the profits that we recognize from running the Green Century publicly traded mutual funds are returned back to those owners to continue to fund their advocacy and their campaigning primarily in the environmental sphere. So there's a, a very virtuous circle here of what we're doing. More importantly, our owners and our culture and our values really um, dictate how these funds were created in terms of being very, very deep green. Uh, 
I, I mentioned that we are the first family of funds to completely divest of fossil fuel free, uh, to, of fossil fuel companies. Um, we're, we're proud of that, and we're proud of, most importantly, that we haven't sacrificed any financial um, gain because of that choice. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why, why we um, chose to do that um, by looking at these slides. Certainly there are moral and political reasons. Um, the existential crisis of our time is in fact global climate change. And if you don't see that, and you don't see the fact that it's anthropogenic climate change, and that um, uh, then, then you're simply a denier. And you either have a political or a financial interest in defending the status quo. In some cases, it may be biblical, but I'm not gonna go down on the religious vent right now. Um, so, more importantly than the sort of the political um, and the moral, from my perspective, and I think those are really philosophically the underpinning of what we do at Green Century, there are financial reasons to do this. And I think we have to understand that there are incredible opportunities to move our economy to a sustainable economy, and not just in energy, across all sectors. And there's a huge monumental flow of capital getting in front of sustainable technology, sustainable transportation, water infrastructure, filtration, monitoring, um, logistics, um, stuff David will talk about. And we want to be positioned right in front of that movement of capital for the benefit of our shareholders and to make profit. So we're not at all in any way sacrificing investment return. Um, we made the decision, we have, and this wasn't like a, a huge quantum leap for Green Century to go fossil fuel free or to divest. Because for 20 years we'd been the leaders in terms of environmental, social, and governance issues. And we never had the largest, most egregious, most deleterious polluters um, and, 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 and tobacco companies or companies that are uh, developing GMOs whose whose safety hasn't been proven. Um, so this wasn't a, a big change for us to go fossil fuel free, but we decided to do it, and, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what we've done, but we did it because we felt it was time. Somebody had to lead the movement, and somebody had to say, these are not good investments. These oil companies and these large petrol companies and the companies that support them in the carbon supply chain need to be outed for, in fact, what they are and what they're doing to our, to our Earth. Now, we've seen this, yeah, we thank you, we've seen this in various other divestment movements. And they're not quite analogous to what we're doing at Green Century, but we've seen it in Burma. Uh, we've seen it certainly in South Africa. Um, we've seen it, and I think this is the, 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 the closest analogy, is in the tobacco divestment movement, where we looked at an endemically harmful product and the fact that those companies were externalizing the cost to you and me and to our governments. Oh, and by the way, killing us. Mm -hmm. And doing it in, in very nefarious ways, spiking tobacco, um, you know, influencing public policy, out and out lying. And I think that's probably the best analogy to what we're trying to do with the fossil fuel divestment. We recognize that we are not going to financially bankrupt these fossil fuel companies. Let's be really clear here. That's not the goal. But the goal is to hopefully morally bankrupt them and take away their social license to operate and to decrease the influence that they can have in our political decision making. And at some point, make them pariah actors in civil society. I, I wanna be perfectly clear, I'm not a scientist. I don't have any problem making political statements. And that's the politics of it. The finance of it is even more compelling. And it rests on this idea, as Nicole alluded to so um, adeptly, is this idea of stranded assets. What are stranded assets? And, and many of you may have read Bill McKibben's um, you know, seminal work in uh, Rolling Stone a couple of summers ago, um, where he said, in order for us to keep our global climate temperature below a rise of two degrees centigrade, we need to keep a great majority of our fossil fuels in the earth. And that estimate ranges from 40% to 80% based on the probability you want of actually keeping our global climate temperature below 2% centigrade, centigrade 
raise, or rise, excuse me. So the, the, the economics of it is that companies have these assets, oil companies, and they're valued at full value, when in fact they may not be able to come to market at full value, and they certainly won't become, come to market at a value that can justify the initial investment if oil hovers at $50 a barrel. So one of the greatest blessings that we've had in this movement is say, is it worth it for you to extract that oil? Are you gonna get a return on your investment with commodity prices tanking at the end of last year? We don't think so in the long run. More importantly, you gotta be crazy if you're gonna to continue to explore for new reserves to take our shareholder money, and, and, and let, let me be clear, we don't own oil companies except in a small select portfolio that we use as an activist portfolio. So for our shareholders in the Green Century Funds, we don't own any oil company. Um, but the, the idea for any investor in an oil company, where's the, the, the economic argument and the logic around continuing investing in new exploration for new reserves when your proven reserves probably won't provide you the re return on investment because of increased competition from alternative energy sources um, and uh, decreased demand for your product. And uh, 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 I, I forgot my, 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 my last point there, but it's, it simply doesn't make economic sense to bring that oil to market. Um, many people would say, well, we want to engage with oil companies. We want to stay at the table. I want to sit down with the oil company executive and say, let's talk about your base product. Let's talk about what you, let, let's talk about your commitment to renewables. And we say, that's a fallacious argument. What has it gotten us in 20, 30 years of engaging with, with oil companies whatsoever? So we don't buy the idea that you have to stay invested in an oil company or a large energy company because you're not going to have much of a voice at that table. The only thing I want to talk to an energy company about is how much money they're going to give me back of my investment through an increased dividend and not spend it on risky investments in assets that are eventually going to be stranded. And I think that's a, that's a, a dialogue that some of the more activist uh, shareholders in oil companies are engaging with. So we think there's moral, political, certainly economic, uh, and mostly in terms of your investment portfolio, financial reasons for doing this. Um, I got a little bit off my slides here. Um, I don't, actually, I don't really want to use the slides at all. I, you know, it, it's more of a distraction because, yeah, yeah, no, I, I can't follow them, frankly. Um, and they're a little too detailed. The, the, the point with um, Green Century's approach is uh, that if we can take the money out of risky investments in fossil fuel companies and put it into companies that are driving the sustainable economy across all sectors. Good example here locally is Qualcomm. Qualcomm's a market leader, 74% market share. Uh, they have, a, they've really addressed their hazardous materials um, output. Um, they've uh, adopted a code of ethics in terms of electronic industry citizenship coalition, so they, their uh, supply chain is uh, conflict-free. An excellent company in technology that you could be proud to own in a fund like Green Century. Um, what would be another uh, really good company in the, in, in the traditional space? Uh, there, there's a water company, very small water company, we actually don't invest in it, but it's good to know about, that's developing desalination outside of a particular market where they existed, which was in the Caribbean Basin. And they're building a plant in Rosarito, Mexico, what, 50 miles from here? Which is expected when it comes online to uh, desalinize 100,000 gallons of water per day with the expectation that they can provide the city of San Diego with 20,000 acre feet of water, which is equivalent to roughly two-thirds of your municip municipal water demand. So that's um, CWCO, it's Consolidated Water. It's a small cap company. It's actually not a holding in our, in our fund, but it's an interesting idea. And um, David can certainly talk about other ways 
that you can capture value in an investment portfolio by investing in companies that are capturing market share, that are driving profits, um, and that are building a more sustainable economy. Our idea is twofold. Avoid risk, capture opportunity. The risk is obvious. And we've been vocal. We've been out there. We work with 350.org National, um, Invest, Divest, the Intentional Endowments Network, which is working with colleges and universities to get them to look at carbon asset risk in their investment portfolios. Um, we're not afraid to come out here and say, this is where we stand. It's important for us to take a stand and to vocally go out. And I ask all of you to think about doing that as well, not only with your investments. I mean, I'm not going to sell the products, but you, know, you can invest in Green Century for as little as $1,000, all right? You should all be contributing to your IRA. You have about a month um, to do it again. But think about integrating those values, the deep-seated environmental values, into your investment portfolio and allow professionals like Green Century to not only manage it for financial return, but to leverage it to get this message out about divesting from risky assets that fossil fuel companies are in. Not only do we simply divest and try to align the values uh, of our shareholders and our nonprofit owners into the investment portfolio, we actually engage with companies that we do own. So we have addressed the issue of deforestation primarily with consumer product companies because we've came to come to realize that um, a huge driver of global climate change is deforestation. And a, few, a huge recent driver of deforestation has been the surging demand for palm oil, particularly in the equatorial region in Southeast Asia. Now, why palm oil? Well, it's replaced soy and it's replaced corn because it's um, nine times as productive per hectare as either of those crops. And it also doesn't have trans fat, so it has some uh, health benefit as well. Uh, the problem with it is uh, that you have to raise high or burn, slash and burn, high carbon content, high carbon stock forest to do it. So you're taking away the lungs of the earth and actually burning it. So it's, a, it's kind of a, you know, it's, it, it's a double bad thing. You know, it's, you, you're taking away the sink and you're burning it. And sometimes these fires go for months in Southeast Asia and re release a ridiculous amount of carbon. So we've worked with companies like Starbucks and Smuckers, um, Panera, to say, we want you to certify that your global supply chain of palm oil, that it comes in everything from bread products to cosmetics, is deforestation free. And they're like, well, how, how are we going to do that? Starbucks is actually was kind of a leader in doing this because they had other issues, obviously, with their coffee supply chain. So they said, we'll tackle this. And they did. Kellogg's was probably our biggest coup this past year that we got them to commit that all their, all their palm oil was going to be deforestation free. In turn, they went to their suppliers, who we don't own, and said, we need you to do this. We need Bungie and ConAgra and ADM and these huge global traders and a company called Wilmar, which is a privately held Malaysian company that, that commands 40% of the palm oil supply. And we said, that because people like Kellogg's and Unilever and Panera and Starbucks was asking for it, they said, we will commit to doing this because our biggest clients are asking for it. This has happened over the course of about two and a half years. So, Neil. <clears throat> and in the next five years, let me just finish with the, the power stat. 90% of uh, palm oil supply chain will be deforestation free, which is equal to the carbon CO2 emission of North and South America combined. So we've been very effective in terms of not only getting out of bad industries, but looking at industries where we can have an impact on climate change to leverage our ownership. We're a small fund, relatively speaking. We're 275 million. But our impact is, is sort of percussive. We're strategically working with certain companies so that we can have an impact far beyond our, our, our actual financial footprint. And we're proud to do that. Awesome. There you go. Sorry for not using the slides. You know, when I first walked in, I thought, this is like um, ground control. You know, this is like, you know, this is like Houston or something, right? And I was expecting David Bowie to come up and start. Uh, that would have been awesome. ground control. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. All right.
So, uh, so this is a nice play on what Green Century is doing. Um, Masada, if you could talk to us about 350, I, I think you maybe ha you can expand on the, on the stranded assets issue. And I think there was some overlap with Bill McKibben, but I know you have a lot more going on that you can talk about. Yeah, I, th I thought I was the 350 rep in the room, but <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> um, so, and so I got some questions while you're doing that. I got some questions um, for Nicole. If you have any questions for Neil on Green Century Funds, again, just raise them up in the air. And Stephen, if you can go around and collect those. I'm, I already know I'm not going to be able to get to all of these. All right. So if you've got questions that I don't get to today, please, we've got a sign-up sheet in the front. And we've got a checkbox for uh, the Climate Action Campaign. We've got a checkbox for 350. We've got a checkbox for me. If you've got questions for David or Neil, um, please come to me with those. And I'm happy to connect you with them and address those questions um, outside of this forum. And then, Peter, if we go to 7.30, if you've got to leave, I said 5.30, 530 to 7.30 is when the event officially will end. If we, if we are so in, engrossed here, Peter, are we able to stay a little bit sure. longer? OK. So we can stick around longer and have a conversation afterwards if your schedule permits and uh, keep this dialogue going. All right, Ms. Masada, are you ready? So um, my name is Masada Dizenhaus. I'm a co-founder and um, no, I can't because I need to look at my notes. Just trust me. <laughs> if there's anybody who can't see me, you can come closer. Um, so um, I'm a co-founder and steering committee member of San Diego 350. And I'm really happy to talk to you tonight about this powerful tool in, in uh, fighting climate change. And um, so uh, as Neil was talking about, um, Bill McKibben really sort of kicked off this, this global movement of divestment with his article in 2012 that was called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. And I have a link to it later on. If you haven't read it, you absolutely should. And uh, he basically talks about three simple numbers that add up to um, global catastrophe and that make it clear who the real enemy is. So the first of those numbers is the two degrees that Neil mentioned. And that is the temperature rise that most of the world's countries uh, have agreed cannot be exceeded if we want to maintain a stable climate. And uh, the world's temperature has already risen about 0.8 degrees, and this is all Celsius. Um, and we already have another 0.8 degrees locked in based on the fossil fuels we've burned so far because of the lag between when you, when you emit the, the uh, greenhouse gases and when the temperature of the planet rises. So that leaves us 0.4 degrees, which is really a very small window. And also this article was written in 2012, so it's already smaller than that. And we haven't done very much since then, in case you haven't noticed. Um, <laughs> so the second number is 565 gigatons carbon dioxide. Here's my little pointer. And um, that number is the amount of carbon dioxide in all the known reserves. Uh, uh, sorry, that's the wrong number. Five, 575 is the amount of carbon dioxide that scientists have told us that we cannot exceed putting in the atmosphere if we want to stay below that two degrees Celsius. So that's you know some, some amount, you know, it's gigatons um, of carbon dioxide. Um, at the current rate, what I find really scary about this particular number, so again, this article was written in, I wasn't ready for that, um, in uh, 2012. Um, the really scary thing about the 575 is that when, that was, when this article was written, we were on track to blow past that number in 15 years, so probably about 12 years now. That's, that's our window, basically, is 12 years. Okay, now I'm ready for the next number. <laughs> the third number is really the scariest number, and that is the amount of carbon dioxide in all the known reserves of oil, gas, and coal in the world. And that number has actually gotten much higher than that by now because of um, innovations in fracking and uh, further development of the tar sands in Alberta. So, um, so it's even a you know it was five times as big then. It's it's a it's a bigger discrepancy now, um, and that's where that eighty percent comes from that Neil mentioned. Um, that we need that's why we need to leave eighty percent of known reserves in the ground, and this really points to, you know, who's to blame for why we haven't acted so far, and that's the the you know the companies that stand to lose from this, and they're the people who have this giant amount of money. 
um, basically that they're not going to be able to make use of, um, or you know that they think they're going to get. Their shares are based on on uh, on assuming that they're going to be able to develop these reserves, and we know at this point that they're not going to be able to develop them. So um, so these guys over here kind of looks like the tobacco lineup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 the executives of these companies, and um, you know the fossil fuel industry is one of the most prof profitable um, industries in the world. The top four companies um, have revenues of over a trillion dollars, just the f top four. And uh, n if that's not enough money for them, they're also receiving about twenty billion dollars a year in subsidies, and. They're taking some of that money, a very small percentage of that money, in the hundreds of millions, and spending it on disinformation and lobbying. And uh, you know, that's a good chunk of probably why we don't have action in Congress. You know, I mean, you probably all remember a few years back when Republicans actually thought we should do something about climate change, and they weren't throwing snowballs, you know, in the Senate. Um, so in that article, you know, Bill talks about, well, you know, we have this this huge industry. How can we make headway? against this industry. And so he calls basically in that article for a divestment movement like the one that helped, that helped to end apartheid in um, South Africa. There I am. Um, and uh, w after he put out that article, he went on tour. Some of you may have gone to one of his tours. There was, one, there was a stop in LA that some of our folks went to. And, um, and he took this idea out there and there was, there was a huge response from it. So there, there are divestment groups at colleges all over the country working on divestment. And uh, this is one, you know, um, at one of the UC schools. And there are colleges that have, um, that have divested at this point. And there are also um, big foundations, the Rockefellers, who of course, you know, their initial money came from fossil fuels, um, divested their funds, which total almost a billion dollars. And um, there are cities like San Francisco and Seattle which said they were gonna pull their funds, mostly pension funds, um, you know, from supporting, from investing in fossil fuels. Um, so th there's been a lot of movement. There's also been churches and, and other types of institutions. Um, I did wanna mention that um, our folks in San Diego and folks around California have a campaign going on to, um, to uh, try and get CalPERS and CalSTRS, which are you know, two of the biggest pension funds in the country. Uh, to divest, and those are the pension funds that serve retired uh, California employees and teachers in California. Um, probably many of you belong to one of those. Um, and uh, I also wanted to say, well, that one's not, um, whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, I also wanted to just um, say about uh, San Diego 350, we're an all-volunteer uh, local organization here in San Diego. We're loosely affiliated with the international 350.org, and we very much support the divestment efforts. And we, we work a lot on advocacy. There's our folks meeting with uh, Lisa Schaefer, who's a council member in Encinitas. We do, oops, <laughs> we do um, a lot of educational programs. Here's us having an educational program here at the Sim Center. And we also um, put on rallies and huge demonstrations. Uh, this is the People's Climate March, which we organized last year, um, that brought 1,500 people together and was the largest of its kind. I also wanted to very quickly explain what th where the 350 comes from, because I know that's a source of confusion to people. So um, I'm in this slide now. So the 350 comes from, from looking at the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So over the course of human history and uh, for the last 800,000 years or so, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been pretty stable. Can you hit the down, whoever's doing that one? Yeah, thanks. Okay, it has been pretty stable at about 275 parts per million. We're currently, again, Peter, thanks, at about 400 parts per million. And if we stay on the track we're on now, we'll be at, we could be at, at 550 parts per million by the middle of the century. And the, one more time. <laughs> And uh, the, the level that scientists consider the highest safe level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 350 parts per million. That's where the name comes from. Um, <laughs> I think it'll be, yes, difficult to get back there. Um, I have one more slide, which um, just has some links. 
that you may find useful to our organization, to the Go Fossil Free is the, uh, is the California effort to divest CalPERS and CalSTRS, and I can talk more about that later. And um, Fossil, oh, I'm sorry, Fossil Free CA is that one. Go Fossil Free is the international um, divestment site, and it has a lot of very useful information. If you have not read that Rolling Stones article, you really should. And I also have them on a handout, which are on the table over there, as well as a handout about our organization. Awesome. Okay, all right, so the, the series of speakers here, we've got legislation coming down the pipeline that's gonna significantly um, impact how much fossil fuels, hopefully, that we're using. We've got, uh, we've got money moving out of, uh, out of the fossil fuel industry. We've got this, this issue of stranded assets, right? So this concept, I don't know if that was clearly gotten across. If, if you own stock in, a, in an oil company that's got a stock value, right? Let's say $10 a share, and 80% of its assets are in the ground that can't ever be used, potentially, right? If this legislation gets passed, if we say, hey, 350, that we gotta start going down on that number, we can't get to those assets. What happens to the stock price at that point? Right, so there's a strong financial argument, like Neil said, behind this, uh, this idea of getting our pensions, getting our personal dollars. All right, so we're gonna move them out of oil. What are we gonna do with them? How are we gonna invest our money? How are we gonna get our energy? And that's David's uh, crux, I guess, of your presentation. All right, great. And again, questions if you have them for uh, Masada. Green Green backer. I thought ahead. Oh, this works. All right. There's also more food. If anybody's hungry, feel free to help yourselves. All right, shall I do it again? Yeah. Okay, great. So thanks very much for having me. Um, so I have a background that's very similar to Shane's. I was on Wall Street for many years, and primarily in the, in the business of investments. Uh, and I dealt with all sorts of different investments, but traditional ways of looking at the capital markets and investing your capital. And over the years, I developed a, a social consciousness, and I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm a tree hugger. I really am. I love hiking. I love swimming in nice, clean water. I like all these kinds of things. I have a young son. I want him to be able to grow up in a nice, clean planet. I almost never say that in my presentations around the country because my theory and our theory as a business is that in order to get ordinary people to focus on climate change, we need to make them advocates for climate change by allowing them to become a constituent in the, in the revolution. So what we found over the years is the, there was an amazing um, epiphany that I went through when I got involved very early in the, in, in the REIT industry. And I saw how real estate investment trusts were able to get tax changes in Washington and get all sorts of different legislation to pass that benefited ownership of real estate. And how did they do that? Well, they sold products to ordinary people who benefited from owning real estate, and they advocated for changes that would benefit real estate. So they became advocates, even though they didn't really care about tax policy, they were self-interested individuals trying to achieve a goal. And I see the same kind of thing here. In order to actually make the renewable energy future work, you need people on both sides of the aisle to go out and say, I'm advocating for solar policies or renewable energy policies that make it fair, right? So, We've created uh, essentially a vehicle that allows ordinary 
individuals to own renewable energy assets through this fund. So we have a registered product, it's an SEC registered product. We're in the process of raising $1.25 billion in this public offering, and we're going to invest it in renewable energy assets around uh, the United States and also in Canada. That's the basic idea. So you're all aware of what renewable energy is. This is a standard slide. Sometimes there are people that I meet with that don't know what renewable energy is. They think in terms of traditional like solar thermal. They don't know what photovoltaic is. They don't know what wind is. They don't know that there are many different forms of renewable energy. Obviously there's solar, there's wind, there's hydropower um, in many different forms, and there's geothermal power that are also renewable energy forms. So what we do is that energy is converted into electricity. We're like a mini utility. So if you think again, my, my broad idea here is that in the past people bought into real estate investment trusts because it allowed an ordinary investor to become the landlord. That's what a REIT is, right? They own the real estate through their own ownership in this real estate investment trust. What we do is we allow you to become the utility. That's the basic thesis behind our approach. So what we do is we buy these facilities that generate power from renewable sources. The, the power is converted into electricity using solar, wind, other kinds of technologies. And then the electricity is sold to utilities, municipalities, and corporations under long-term contract. So we have a very stable source of cash from the sale of that electricity over a long period of time. So if you look over here, um, yeah, actually, great. So if you look here, ground mount solar facility. So this is a, an example of a transaction that we would do. So we would buy a facility that's operating, it's generating renewable energy, it's generating electricity from solar. The facility would sell the power to an off taker, typically a utility, municipality, or corporation. It's typically sold for 20 to 25 years, and there's usually a little contractual increase in the price of electricity, just like you see on your bill every year. It goes up by 2 3%. Same kind of thing in our contract. And then that's the basic source of cash that we use. So we are a little mini utility. We're selling renewable power to utilities and corporations, and we're getting paid on a monthly basis. What we do to get investors to participate in this is we pay a distribution. So our distribution rate is 6% currently, and because of earnings and profits rules and accelerated depreciation, that uh, distribution is tax deferred for 10 years. So if you invest in this vehicle, you're getting 6%. Now I defy you to find a nice safe opportunity where you can get 6% income from investing in assets like this. Uh, so it really is a, uh, something that plays into a lot of trends in the investment industry. And if you consider this being tax advantaged, by comparison with other investments on a tax equivalent basis, just using the federal rate, 33% marginal tax bracket, you've got an 8.96% cash return to the investor just for holding this, this uh, asset. So just some statistics. 70% of new power generation is expected to come from renewable sources by 2030. This is Bloomberg New Energy Finance's forecast. That requires $7 trillion worth of new capital. That's a massive amount of capital. It cannot come from government. It has to come from ordinary people investing their money in these type of assets. So we believe that our fund is one of the types of vehicles that allow us to deploy money in renewable energy assets. What's driving the demand in this space? I, I like to think that it's about social responsibility, but what really is driving it is there's growing energy demand, all using more laptops, iPads, that kind of thing. Aging and retirement of existing power plants. So you, you did mention uh, there's a nuclear power plant down the shore that's being re, re, just being removed. That needs to be replaced. In other words, they need the power that that was providing to be replaced. So we think renewable energy can fill a spot there. Call the continuing falling cost to build renewable energy, it's a big um, area where you're, you're starting to see renewables be competitive in almost every market with other traditional forms of energy. 
And then the other thing where government is playing a part is on the state level, they're requiring that a certain amount of power that utilities purchase come from renewable sources. So just as an example, this is, uh, we call it Welcome to Terror Dome. This also comes from Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So these are the traditional forms of energy here. So Henry Hub is natural gas at the wellhead. There's coal, obviously. Brent is oil. LNG is liquefied natural gas and solar. This is the cost of solar. Okay, so you see it's fallen drastically to where it's now competing. And that trend is com continuing. So solar, I am absolutely convinced that solar will beat traditional forms of energy in cost over time. Without a subsidy. Without a subsidy. Okay, so if you look at here is... Okay, so what, what you see, that big line here, that's... No, it's going down. So this is the past, this is now. So this is the years here on the, on the graph. So these are the prices of the various things. This is what solar was relative to the other forms of energy just a couple of years ago. And this is where solar is now. As far as the cost of energy the output. The cost. Yeah. It's dropping like a rock in terms of the cost of doing these type of facilities. So where we, what we see is we can actually build solar facilities sell the power to a utility or to uh, a company where we can get them an automatic savings from what they are currently getting from the grid. That's an amazing change. Okay, so what another driver for the industry is renewable portfolio standards. So in a number of states, there is a requirement, it's currently 29 states, there's a requirement that the utilities purchase a certain amount of their power from renewable sources. So if you look at California, uh, by 2020, there's a requirement that the state utilities purchase 33% of their energy from, from renewable sources. Right now, if you look at a utility bill, it's about 22%. So there's a lot of utility investments and utility programs that have to be put in place to generate that hire. Governor Brown just announced that he would like to have it be 50% by 2030 for the entire state. And this is not just a California story. If you look across here at North Carolina, North Carolina is now the third largest state for the installation of solar assets. Okay, that is a, it's a dramatic change. That's a state where there's a lot of conservative viewpoints and all of a sudden, um, you're starting to see North Carolina lead the southern states towards renewables. So it's a very big political shift. Um, I, I won't go through, uh, you know, a number of these points. These are about the investment itself. Um, so we, we believe that there's an opportunity to create capital appreciation for investors in the assets through a listing of our assets on a public exchange. Remember, we're direct investors in these assets. So maybe if you can shift ahead one or two slides, I just want to show one or two pictures of some of the things that we, uh, what, that we buy. Um, yeah. Okay. Let me. Yeah. It'll be, I think, over there. Forward. No, I want to go forward. Forward a couple more. Yeah. No, no, one more. Uh, no, one more. One more. <laughs> All right. So here. That's perfect. Okay. So if you see over here. One of the assets that we currently own is the solar facility outside the Denver International Airport. So if you fly into the Denver International Airport, the largest airport in the United States, and you drive outside there, you're going to see solar panels. We own that panel on behalf of our investors. So our investors invest in the fund. We're selling all of the power generated by the, by the solar field to the Denver International Airport. We generate returns from that that we give to our investors in the form of dividends. That's basically the idea. We have uh, assets that we own in currently six states, and we also own some assets in Ontario, Canada. These are all contracted sales. So we're selling typically to utilities, municipalities, and corporations. 
high investment grade buyers of our, of our electricity. So we have a nice story around the economic returns of our investment. And we think that this kind of uh, investment will get people that aren't interested in climate change to help move the country in the direction of solving this problem. Because they're going to look at it from the perspective of how can I make money, right? They are investing in real estate. They're investing in other things. How can I earn a 6% tax deferred return from anything, right? This is one way they can do it. And yes, it happens to be socially responsible. It happens to be supporting the green economy. So that's our story. That's what we're trying to do with our business. Thank you. All right. So, so we're running up against the time. And I really apologize. I didn't want to stop anybody short because I thought all, each one of their presentations was very engaging. And we've got some great questions here. But I want to be respectful of your time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of wrap things up. If you can stick around, please do. Panelists will stick around. I'll stick around. We can go through these questions. If you've got to get up and go, we understand. Please sign up, and we can get your questions answered. If you can't stick around, have them answered over email. Um, uh, Chelsea Zabayos, thank you very much for the food. She's just put out some more food. So again, if you can stick around, grab a little bite to eat, and we'll, we'll start getting through some of these questions. Yes, there's literature there um, from our speakers. And, um, and so as, as a wrap up, I just want to ask um, each one of the panelists one thing that we could do to help support their work. And that will leave all of you with a takeaway, something that um, you, know, you can go home and, and feel like you actually have an action plan. One of my pet peeves is leaving these things and thinking, wow, that was great information, but I have no idea how I can actually make a difference now. Um, so we'll just start. We'll go right down here. Um, Masada, what's one thing that you'd like to, uh, from us that we can do to help support what 350 is doing? Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of ways that people can get involved in divestment movements. Um, you can talk to um, your church if you belong to one. You can talk to other people in your pension fund, whether it's the city or one of these or Calsters or Calpers, um, or if you um, work at one of the colleges or you have a, a kid at one of the colleges, you can think about joining a divestment effort there. So um, please talk to us about how to do that. So you can help facilitate and make sure that conversation, we know what we're saying, the right things. And yeah. Perfect. All right, thank you. Nicole? Well, I said it earlier. I do believe that public input during the um, public process in reviewing the environmental review process for the climate plan is a huge opportunity. So what's that? March 20th, March 20th is, yeah, is one deadline. But it's, it's going to be going on for months. But anyhow, just... Our elected officials hearing from you, the community, that what they're doing, they're on the right track and that you support them and you're behind them is extraordinarily effective. So for me, that's the number one thing people can do. Perfect. Thank you. I think it's demand, demand, demand. Demand that your investment portfolios reflect your values. Go to your workplace. Look at your 401k, your 403b. Ask your benefits manager, why don't we have a socially or environmentally responsible investment option here? Look at your own investment portfolio. Talk to your financial advisor. Demand these things. If you don't have a financial advisor, talk to Shane. It's, it's the grassroots demand that's going to drive the new economy. We've seen it here and here throughout this presentation. And it's our responsibility to go out and affect and make that change that we envision by actually demanding it. Thank you. So one of the things that I, I did was um, we had a little in investor event, and we invited people to attend uh, this uh, event in Park Slope, Brooklyn, where I live, in an outdoor park. And afterwards, we had some people from some not-for-profits come and, and speak about ways to get involved. We had 60 people show up. We were expecting maybe. 10 or 15 people to show. People are really interested in this. And some of the folks actually on that night formed a group and are now working for New York Shared Solar, which is a, a, uh, a way that communities can get involved in solar energy. So I think just getting together with people 
and bringing some speakers along will get people in the, in the seats. And there's just lots and lots of ways on the grassroots level to get involved. Um, so I would say Vote Solar is a website that talks about policies that are associated with solar energy, and that might be where I would start. I mean, obviously, we're in the investment business, so we won't turn any investments down. All right. <laughs> Okay, and uh, so let me just wrap up. I mentioned earlier about my manager at Wells Fargo Snickery when I brought my business plan to the table, and then a couple years later, I got a call from a recruiter there. And I see everybody in this room in a similar situation, right? We're on the cutting edge of this. We have choice here. Let's be leaders. Let's, uh, let's choose with our dollars, with our, with our votes, with, uh, with our letters to our policymakers. And uh, we might get a snicker or two from friends or family members who don't see this tidal wave of divestment coming. But I think, and I think all the panelists here would agree with me, that in a, in a couple years, in a few years, uh, we might be the ones having, having the last snicker. All right, so thank you very much for attending. All right, so I don't see anybody leaving. That's fantastic. And I, I won't speak bad about you if you do. All right, so some really great questions came in. Um, one of them, uh, interesting, this one just came in, uh, I think it was one of the last ones here. It was for David. David, where is the tidal wave renewable energy? And I think what you mean, yes, so what you mean, okay, okay right. Sorry, I read it wrong. Tidal slash wave of renewable energy. And, and, and so am I, what, what do you mean by that? Tidal power. Tidal power and wave power. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So tidal power has one major drawback, which is that when you, have, when you have assets that are sitting in the tide, the tide is acidic. It's highly acidic. So when you put long-term assets, you need to generate power for 20 years. In salt water, those parts corrode very, very rapidly. It's a big issue. And there are ways that people are working on to, to get that to work. But right now, by comparison with traditional forms of energy, which is the benchmark we all have to hit, we all have to beat traditional energy in cost. It's just too expensive at the moment. But they are making strides in a lot of areas, and I think that will be part of the mix at some point. All right. So I think I know the answer, but uh, I'm going to address This one I think is for Nicole. Our Utilities legally obligated to make the grid available for community choice energy projects. Great question, but the answer, thank goodness, is yes. Legally required. So, uh, we actually have not heard that they have not made, they have not made things difficult for the community choice programs. All right. Is the reason I think this is also for Nicole? Is the reason um, that Todd Glory didn't get reelected? Uh, as, city, as council president due to his courageous uh, move to study the community choice and what does Sherry Leitner, uh, how does she feel about uh, community choice? Oh, wow. Choice? We're raw politics. Yeah. I love it. I live and breathe politics. No. The truth is, no. Those two things were not connected at all. So, um, no, Todd's courage stands alone, but it did not negatively impact him politically. As Well, as far as I can tell. But no, and, and Sherry Leitner, as far as uh, Council Member Sherry Leitner um, is supportive of the climate plan. And I think everybody's position on community choice at this point is that show us the numbers, show us the data. And, you know, but I, we've, we've had a pretty good reception for community choice thus far. Mm -hmm. All right, so this one, I think anybody from the panel and maybe multiple answers, uh, if you guys have something to say about this, what's the best way to overcome uh, many people's feelings that we're powerless and that there's nothing we can do to change the major corporation's control over the money? Witness the president vetoing the Keystone Pipeline. Three, three years ago, or five years ago, whenever it started, you know, every newspaper was saying, this is a done deal, it's going to get the green light, et cetera, et cetera. There's been a huge, huge movement against it. The president has vetoed it and is, you know, expected to reject it sometime in the near future. Um, and that is because of people power and partially because of the People's Climate March and things like that where people just turn out in numbers and say, we do not want this thing. And certainly uh, beyond the power of the grassroots movements to, to affect these changes. Um, we live in a hyper-capitalist society. There's a profit to be made. 
and there's opportunities, we're going to take advantage of it. And I think there's hope in that. I would love to see a price on carbon. I don't know if it's politically going to happen. And I think that irrespective of the, the Slim chances of that happening, there are still incredible investment opportunities and ways to profit, as David has shown. And this return is ridiculous. You know, this 6% and tax-free is phenomenal. Well, it brings up another question that I get sometimes, talking about renewable energy, investing in renewable, renewable energy. And David, I think this one's directed at you. And it's, you know, what happens if a Republican gets voted in as the next president and, uh, and we see maybe legislation not go the way we might want to see them go? How is that going to affect your fund? How is that going to affect our ability to invest in renewable energy? So I personally believe that the cost curves based on manufacturing. So really what's happening in renewable energy is there's a revolution in the manufacturing of renewable energy uh, power facilities, right? So... What I believe is that that cost curve is continuing to decline. It is inevitable, whether, it, whether the Republicans or the Democrats are in charge, renewable energy will beat traditional energy. It will. It's just a matter of whether it does it sooner or later. But it is inevitable that it will be cheaper than, renewable ener than traditional energy. So I, I think if you just look at it from the perspective of either there's a delay, if if the Republicans attack this as a policy, um, or, but, but it won't stop at long term. My personal view is that this has become a purple issue in a lot of states. Okay? It's not, no longer just California and just Massachusetts and just New Jersey that are doing this. This is in 29 states. People are realizing how much money they can, be, they can make. I actually went and I traveled to Western North Carolina, and I met with a guy who was, well, he's a good old boy, as rapidly anti-everything liberal as you could possibly be. And people were afraid to introduce me to him and have me tell him what we're doing. But I did anyway, and he's like, oh, that's great. You guys are making money. That's, that was his yardstick. As long as it makes money, it's good. If it doesn't make money, it's bad. So I really think that it's kind of moving in that direction. And the evidence I would give for this is just take the American Petroleum Institute's annual report, which just came out, and they talk about how wonderful solar is and how wonderful wind is. This is the industry lobbying group for the American Petroleum industry. So because they don't see it as competitive, what they want to have is that the, the policies that support oil and the some policies that support renewables be kind of always re renewed, right? They want both to be. No, well, they, they are in a minor way, but they have tax benefits. And what people are talking about is, OK, I'll give up the tax benefits associated with renewables if you give up the tax benefits associated with oil. And they say, no way, <laughs> right? So they're like, let's keep all of them. Right? So that's what's actually happening. But you can actually read the American Petroleum Institute annual report on solar. It's very laudatory. And wind. Very laudatory. It's all working. All of the above strategy is working, according to the American Petroleum Institute. Hmm. So I just don't think there's a lot of political hate to change this at this point. You'll hear some crazy people in Congress throw snowballs, but that... But that the, it's just not gonna not gonna do anything. That's my view. All right. Next question: What will it take to get CCA implemented? Will there need to be a ballot initiative? Great question. The only thing that's legally required is for the city council to take a vote in support of community choice. But obviously, sometimes you have to go to the ballot box in order to sort of push the elected officials in the right direction. If you're not getting the votes you need at the council level, or if the mayor says, I'm going to veto it, right? You don't have enough votes to override that veto. So that is certainly something that has to be factored in and considered as part of the long-term strategy. It's just, you know, doing anything at the ballot box, but at the ballot box is extraordinarily expensive and extraordinarily risky. And so that isn't the strategy, you know, that's not our, that's not the path we'd like to go down. Yeah, that's not plan A, that's a good way to put it. 
But it's not like we would give up if plan A wasn't going to materialize and we would think about plan B. But, you know, that's, again, that's a whole other layer of strategy and analysis. And um, But we don't have to go there. I guess that's to answer that question. Okay. All right. Well, you're keep on. You're a superstar, Nicole. Keep hold on to that microphone. What about what about animal agriculture as a major source of, G, of greenhouse gases? Thirty-one to fifty-one percent, based on official scientific studies. Well, again, so I was just focused on the city of San Diego emissions, and so the agriculture isn't. Oh, yeah. So it's not based on. Right, and I never know how to frame this. It's it. The calculation is based on how much fuel we burn. Here you. So the, the, the city plan is based on the inventory in San Diego, which does not have a lot of ag animal agriculture. However, changing your diet is the single most effective thing that most people can do to change their own carbon footprint. It's, you know, animal agriculture is anywhere between 14 and 50 percent of, of um, global emissions, and, um, and it makes a huge difference. So. We, we, have, we actually, San Diego 350 has an active team working on this. We're going to have a big display at Earth Day. So if people want to find out more about this, come to us. Yeah, I've got another question about Jenny. Just, yeah. just to uh, follow up on that, I, you know, the, there's a lot of movement within the um, U.S. Food and Drug Administration to change dietary guidelines. And our ownership group, the PERG, particularly the U.S. PERG based in Washington, D.C., has been very influential in moving it toward less meat-based and more vegetable-based. So I think, the, you know, the idea that policy and the culture can change to affect the, the climate, particularly with the, the food choices we make, um, is really gaining strength. Do, do you guys consider that in your investment thesis at Green Century? Not particularly. We look at sustainable agriculture, um, but um, not in terms of dietary requirements or suggestions, no. Um, no, I meant like investing in meat factories or... or oh, no, 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 no. Meeting. We have a screen against industrial farming and what are called CAFOs, Concentrated Animal Feed Operations. Uh, we filed a resolution with Kroger to ask them, they're a big national supermarket chain, to certify that their meat is uh, free of antibiotics that are used on humans because the use of them in animal production is causing the development of superbug bacteria. So we think it's a really big public health issue. Uh -huh. All right, so this I think is directed at Nicole, but I'd actually be interested in hearing David's response to this as well. So let's start with Nicole. <laughs> How crucial is utility involvement in the climate action plan? Will it be a city of San Diego versus SDG&E scenario? Well, ostensibly no, because SDG&E, but actually ratepayer dollars were a part of funding the Climate Action Plan. But again, those are more ratepayer dollars than they were shareholder dollars. So it's our money that was pooled together to help fund um, development of the Climate Action Plan. But really, community choice, I know, you know, it's probably partly how I frame it too, just because of how, you know, I know they feel about community choice. But ideally, community choice is this elegant public-private partnership. Because remember, we're not putting them out of business, right? Their bailiwick, their strength is in delivering the power, their infrastructure. And that's where they make all their money. They have a guaranteed rate of return. It usually borders around 9 and 11%. Talk about a good investment. Um, and so they would still have access. You know, that, is, that would still be under their purview. So the only part that would be under the city or any other local government's purview would be the supply side, which is not where they make the majority of their money. So again, we like to frame community choice as a public-private partnership. But... You know, that's also kind of just, um, you know, some say that's, that's kind of putting window dressing on something. SDG doesn't, I don't think they necessarily view it that way. I guess that's the nicest way to say it. Because they like full, they like full control over both, right? Supply and delivery. Which you can understand because they've had full control for 134 years. So this is a threat to their business model. But, you know, we, we, we keep trying to explain that, you know, they're still going to be in business and they're still going to have, you know, the ability to make money and, and um, continue to thrive. But Got it. Yeah, so just from the perspective of the national story, uh, every state has kind of a different regime associated with utilities. So the utility model, as was mentioned, is typically conceived of as a vertically integrated monopoly where they're producing the power, they're transporting the power, 
they're servicing the customer, they're doing sort of everything. They're buying the supply to support the power. In many states, including states like New York, that's already been stopped, right? So in New York, the utilities don't generate their own power. Okay, they take power from third parties and they are the grid. Their job is to transport energy and service that portion of the grid. So that is something that I think in a lot of the more populous states where rates have gone through the roof, the states are going in, in that direction. And they're saying, let's have competition to provide cheap energy to people. But you guys who are managing the grid, or gals as the case may be, you have to just do that job and you get paid for that. So I think that is something that is definitely going to happen in a variety of states. It's happening nationwide and hopefully it'll happen here. I think the longer term issue is do you need to have one big central power facility located in the desert somewhere and then have the energy transported hundreds of miles to get to your house? Or can you put it close to your house so you don't need all those transmission facilities, right? So distributed power generation, I think is, that's kind of where we're playing. So we're doing smaller solar facilities and we're selling power to people who specifically need that power, right? So I think that is going to be a big change for the utilities and it's much less clear how they win in that game. In New York, they've basically changed the rules. They have one of these very advanced programs to help utilities figure out their new business model. And it's going to be based on um, providing power to individual customers, specific types of services that people need. And I, I think that's where it's going long term. But in the short term, just separating the, the power generation from the distribution is, is going to be the major step. Excellent. All right. Peter, I think you wanted to make an announcement. Sure. Just uh, this leads so much into what we do all the time here, and this is my commercial to get you to come back. All right? Um, just and, and uh, speak into the mic. Speak into the mic. <laughs> We have a partnership with the San Diego Renewable Energy Society for San Diego to, San Diego to be a 100% renewable city. That's on number two up there. Uh, one of our partners is Nicole's organization, Climate Action. Equinox Center was here earlier and also the U.S. Green Chamber. Our next meeting with them is next Wednesday. We're going to have the mayor of Lancaster, three of the sustainability directors from Yolo County, Palo Alto, and Santa Monica. They've already done it. They've already got their city to 100% and more in some cases. So they will be all Skyped in here, and you can learn from how they did it and the, and the challenges that they had. So that's next Wednesday. The following Wednesday, Citizens Climate Lobby, I think, is one of the most aggressive organizations to change tax policy at a national level. They're here in Coronado. That's Mark Reynolds, uh, and they have a, a unique fee and dividend structure that's much simpler than a... Than a cap and trade program. And if you really want to get the best science of this issue around climate change, the following Tuesday, the 24th, uh